What's up, everybody, and welcome to another RTAF podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Norris, and thank you for being here. This episode's guest is Nick Boltman. Nick is an abstract artist living in Arizona. And on this episode, we talk about his recent solo show in London, um, gallery representation, uh, licensing your art. What else do we get into? We get into his process, some of uh, his influences and, and things he does to stay on top of the art momentum. So yeah, I say we get right into it. What do you guys think? Let's do it. Shouts. gonna do a clap all right hell yeah <laughs> dude, i can't hear you i'm just joking <laughs> shut the fuck up dude oh my gosh <laughs> i would have just like i i would have just walked slowly into the mountains there you go throw never, the mic never anyway. to be seen again yeah uh yeah nick boltman welcome to the podcast we've been having uh technical difficulties for about 15 to 20 minutes now but we've gotten to know each other so yeah it was a good little nice. excuse for that yeah for sure yeah well thanks for thanks for being here on rtaf and uh yeah man i've been following your work i i think since like a couple of years ago pretty early on i think yeah is that when you when did you start making art um, posting on social media, August, 2021. And that was really my first introduction to painting, which was basically like fluid painting. So very, you know, trendy over the past 10 years and sure. still continuing to be. And that's where I started. And then it just evolved into the more complex stuff. Nice. So were you making, were you making art before, uh, August, 2021, just not sharing it or, um, no, definitely not. Yeah, I would, um, I've always been like a creative guy and getting my feet wet in a bunch of different areas. Like I used to produce music. Um, I used to do like stick figure animation in high school and I got like really into that, all the fight scenes and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like even like sculpting too. Like I would, I would pick up clay every now and then, but I never really went hard at it. I never posted anything online. Um, I was just known as kind of like that creative guy but i was always doing the more tried and true path of the corporate world and all that kind of stuff so this whole new art thing has is, is been a big shift but it's been great because now i'm like really going hard at my creativity and i'm loving it nice nice so are you are you kind of the type of person who once you latch onto something like that you become obsessed with it whether it's just for a little bit or now with art it's like it seems like you're rocking and rolling on this path for good. Yeah, man. Um, very much so. Yeah. I'm i uh, I'm a very obsessive person to a fault for sure. But, uh, yeah, that's what I'm working on now is like the balancing and, um, you know, my wife and I are working on a thing where, you know, I'll wake up 8am, do my art, eat lunch, um, and then be done by like 6pm. And then like mentally tune out of art, like no social media, no responding to print, you know, DMS, no, like liking people on social media, like none, none of that. Like, and uh, it's been good. It's been healthy because it helps me detach from from the obsessiveness. Yeah, yeah. It's good to set boundaries like that, man. Yeah. Um, it's it's it can be difficult for sure. Um, just sometimes I feel like if oh if I didn't get enough done in the day, I'll I'll be up at you know eight to midnight like doing stuff. Yeah. But do you still do that? Do you like pull? Uh, sometimes you're just like mad focused on a work till like two a.m. Still. Not so much anymore. Um, I've gotten, I, you know, I think I'm a slow learner to be quite honest with you. I mean, you saw all the technical difficulties we had earlier. <laughs> <laughs> we were fully but, prepared to just go to Google meet, like screw zoom, like let's do something completely new. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it took me forever to even 
I'm just now getting a good night's sleep like every mostly every night. Mm-hmm. Um and it took me a long time to sort of realize how to pump the brakes at the end of a day. Um because if something either caught my attention or had me excited, I would just like rev up regardless of what time it was. And now I'm a little more careful with my energy, I'd say. Yeah, man, that's good. I mean, we're like biological creatures that have needs and sometimes our brain can have us running towards a direction that's like incongruent with how we feel. And it's like, once you're aligned, I think maybe later in life, once you've repeated that treadmill so many times, it's, uh, it's more healthy for sure. So it's cool that you're in that zone. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm curious as to what got you started or interested in making paintings. I, you said you were kind of doing the traditional corporate path. I guess give us the cliff notes of of that. And then if you can, um, if there is a moment or an actual turning point, give us that in terms of like, oh, this is when... I knew that I was going to be an artist. Mm -hmm. Um, I still struggle with like calling myself an artist because like, I'm, I feel like I'm more than an artist. Like I'm an artist. I'm a business person. I'm a, I'm a marketing person. I'm a social media person. I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a husband. I'm a dog dad. I'm a homeowner. Like I have all these hats that I'm wearing. An artist is just like one part of my life um, that I've seen a lot of recent success in, but you know, I, and also just like the imposter syndrome of like, I'm an artist, I'm a creative person that, you know, puts his art into the, you know, it's, I don't know, I feel like I'm, I'm more than that. And it's cool that people see me that way. And I, I am struggling to like figure out that identity for myself in general. But I mean, the whole path is like, I, you know, I basically did the really tried and true path, you know, high school, got good grades, um, did track and field my whole life, basically. So I was a thrower, shot put discus hammer throw. My dad almost went to the Olympics in it. And he kind of got us started at a young age. And so, you know, it was pretty instilled in me that, you know, sports were super important and succeeding and trying to, you know, beat your personal best and stuff like that. And in high school, I was, I got eighth in California for a shot put. I was like the smallest guy out there, but I had some pretty good technique. And ultimately that is what got me into Cal Poly, um, where I studied industrial technology and did that for four years and eventually worked at Schneider Electric and, you know, then did sales and then did COVID software sales. And then ultimately, like, I think I was just kind of like burnt out on the path of doing something that didn't like align with my soul. And I kept trying, you know, where I I would like, I'd have days where I'm super motivated and I'd hit my numbers. And then certain days where I'm just like, what am I doing? And, uh, you know, during COVID August, 2021, as I was saying, I just went to Michael's, picked up some paints, did what I saw. I was on social media. I'm like, I think I can do that. It looks cool. And I think I can do that better and started posting my stuff. And like every video just kept getting better and better generated this audience. And I think your question about, you know, when did I know I was going to become an artist? It was ultimately social media and like seeing that people really liked my art and then me enjoying the process of pushing myself to create something I didn't think was possible and just getting addicted to that feeling. And then finally feeling like, Oh my gosh, my creativity, that thing that was dormant in me for so long in the corporate world is something I can really dive into now. Beautiful. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I love a good, like I was in the corporate world and now i said, I said to hell with all that. And, I'm being creative with my life. That's great. Was it, was it scary at all? Like, uh, I guess financially. No, that's the thing, dude. I think, um, I think what's really important that I'm really like thankful for my parents for doing is like instilling it in me that like, you, you want to get good grades. You want to like get a good job set up. Like they didn't, they didn't really focus on like it being my passion or not. They focused more on like using my strengths to my advantage and like, you know, trying to get ahead. And now that I had that like platform, I had some money built up um, and like how to work in a, in a group environment, how to like public speak, how to do all those things that like the corporate world teaches you and having some some cash from that. Like, yeah, it was hard. And like, I was depressed for sure. Like for a year I was on antidepressants. I was seeing a therapist, 
in Pennsylvania right after college, actually. Mm -hmm. So like, it's, it's not amazing, but like, I still recommend for at least me, like people to go through that to, if, if they're not like fully brought up in like a creative space or like know what is for them creatively, at least like the, the corporate world helped me get a foundation. And then from there, I was able to, you know, get a house and have a garage to play in for, for painting and stuff. And I had all these like business and marketing tools and skills that like the creativity came after that. So I was actually really thankful for the whole path. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I didn't know what I wanted to be until or what I wanted to be. I mean, like, I think I, I struggle with the whole concept of identity at all. Like, you know, I, I have a dog as well. I don't know if I consider myself a dog dad or, uh, you know, um, it's all, the, all these, all these terms for what you are, are totally, uh, provisional kind of a thing where you're, you you do you put on and take off the masks as necessary i guess um but yeah that that's um yeah i just i was also i think the difference is like i was just very rebellious for not even not even any real reason you know just to be rebellious maybe that was just part of my dna A and uh I I really wish that I would have had a bit more of a stable foundation, but I think I am. Uh, I might be terminally unemployable, unfortunately. Uh, I can't stay. I can't like hang with something I don't like for very long. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, the only thing I found made it worthwhile is like if you got a good boss, if you got good coworkers, you yeah, can at yeah. least kind of like float through while you guys all kind of commiserate about your day-to-day -day task. And that makes it worth it. Yeah. And like 20% of my mental energy is about like meeting my KPIs and doing all that. But again, I'm just like thankful my, my parents instilled in me. And then I saw like the value of going for that early on, um, putting my head down, grinding, doing all that. So then now I can really integrate all that into this creative thing. That's beautiful, man. That's so awesome. Um, yeah, I didn't take to any of the lessons my parents taught me until I was about, you know, 30. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, now that you is, say, it, yeah, I was like the first born and I think I just like got so much affirmation from being like the spoiled first child. And I like wanted to keep that identity up for so long. And so I kind of just did what I was told, but like, I still had that fire in me to do something different. And that's kind of what this is now. I feel like a kid making art and it's so cool to like relive that thing that was so dormant have you heard of um behavioral genetics um uh, no not technically it's it's kind of my favorite little side topic i guess uh these days it's basically like um things that affect who you are and who you become mm -hmm. uh range as far back f as like where your ancestors lived in the world um whether it was a dry climate uh, like um all all monotheistic religions come from people who lived in deserts which is very interesting um and then how do you, how uh, do you research your family tree in like a good way i mean i think for me it's pretty clear i'm mostly like northern european um, but it, it, to, to get back to the, the train of thought I was on there, uh, behavioral genetics is kind of like, so that affects your personality or who you are. Uh, and then your mother's, it, this is such an interesting fact. And there's, um, there's a professor named, uh, Robert Sapolsky who talks about this a lot. It's kind of my favorite hobby horse right now, I guess. Uh, but he's, he mentions that your mother's socioeconomic status and stress level while you're in the womb will affect how anxious you are. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild? It is wild. I totally could believe that for sure. And then everything. And then when you're, you know, that, um, that very important window in your childhood where, uh, the, your environment that you grew up in, 
sort of informs so so many things so it's a it's an interaction between like your genetics and your environment and super interesting i would love to just like sit down with my parents and kind of like go through that like once we're both at a place where we can yeah i would love to do that i i find it so fascinating i've always been like super introspective like almost to a fault where i become like ruminating a little bit Mm -hmm. same here you studied uh psychology was it i listened to one of your other episodes yeah, I mean, I, I did the four years of college version of psychology in, I finished in 2008. So it's, I still dabble here and there via, you know, podcasts and audiobooks and stuff like that. But um, I need yeah. to get back into that stuff because I was like, I was really into like um, Carl Jung and even like Jordan Peterson who would talk about Carl Jung and like in my early 20s and alan watts and i even read a little bit of nietzsche yeah hell yeah fucked me up man that was like (laughs) beyond good and evil i read some of that book and that was too much honestly yeah yeah i'm i'm a big fan of uh terrence mckenna so i i'm sure things that i say um are often just repurposed mckenna quotes um are you familiar with him Mm mm-hmm nice yeah he says something like you know the thin veil of society is what's keeping us from yeah acting in our own brutal self-interest um but yeah all that stuff's very very interesting to me and so i figured i'd bring it up because you were talking about how your impar- your parents instilled in you this this sort of like work ethic and um just bettering yourself through repetition yeah so yeah you think do you think like do you think it was a lot of sort of feeling depressed that made you want to jettison the corporate career or do you think i did i wouldn't say i was depressed when i was like 26 27 i was more depressed when i was like 22 Mm. fresh out of college but i think for me it was just like you know i'm i'm chugging away i'm doing my job i'm i'm you know doing whatever I, I kind of need something new and I was such like a big leap to just go from like you know posting these little dude you got to see my uh my YouTube I posted this video that was mm-hmm. the first day I painted and it said you know parentheses two years ago and I made this little video for friends and family it was four minutes long of literally the first day I ever did poor painting and I did like a narration and talking about it and I was talking about how I uh I made it just to put some art on my walls because we had bought a house two and two and a half years ago. Walls are completely empty. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't want to get something from like, you know, at home or target or something. I want to make my yeah, own yeah. stuff. I'm creative. I'll give it a try. That was the big Genesis of actually doing the art was like, I could put something on my walls. And I even said that in that video. <laughs> so like, if anyone wants a trip to just check out where I was two and a half years ago, it's the dorkiest video. And I was super embarrassed to share it, but it just shows like how far I've come. And it's really like sentimental. Yeah, what's that? What's that? Uh, there's a quote. It goes something like, "Necessity is the mother of invention," and so you needed art for your walls, and you're just like, "Yeah, why not?" That's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, I just went for it. That's beautiful, man. Um, so I wanted to talk about your your process. I think that uh, abstract work like yours is super interesting and. Honestly, I I think I want to give it a try at some point. It looks very fun and freeing cool. and joyful. Um, what it is. What do you want to know? Yeah, I guess how do you start? Do you just start with like a color palette or how are you how do you approach a blank canvas? Yeah, shoot, man. Um there's so many factors. It's kind of just like it, it's like a million thoughts happening at one time and there's like 20 factors. Maybe one factor is like, oh, I haven't worked with pinks. I want to challenge myself to work with pink. Um, Maybe it's like, do I want this to be more of a super busy, crazy painting? Do I want it to have a central message? Do I want there to be an object touching the ground or like a landscape? Do I want it to be more like alien-like or something a little bit more like earthly and natural? I mean, there's like all these different like mental things that I go through. And color palette, yeah, that's a big one. And then 
And then ultimately it's like, what kind of, how, how splashy do I want it? Do I want it to be like, you know, a ton of splashiness or like thicker paint where it's a little bit more globby and mm. I don't know. I don't, I don't really like talk about my process too much. Cause I'm just in the garage sweating away in Arizona and I'm just like letting mm. things come up as it comes up. And it's like my personal little dojo. And like, I'm uh, working with like an editor and a filmer right now to start making like more professional, like YouTube type content. But I'm oh, yeah. my biggest hurdles is like allowing them into that space when I'm just in that initial creative phase. Right. So like I put a hard line in the sand. I was like, you guys can come when I'm, when I have the vision and you can watch the execution after I've practiced it. But like, I need that space for myself. It's almost better probably that you don't put words to it, huh? Yeah, dude. Cause then I have to, then it's like, Oh, I said it that way, but I didn't, I know I'm going to listen back to this and be like, why did I not say this? Like mm-hmm. it's such a personal weird thing, but I do want people to get an insight into it. So if I'm not explaining it well, then just like ask away. Like I'd love to, see if i can i mean it seems like it seems like every every painting is different for you like you approach your process differently um with every painting um they they are different in color palette and in uh the way that they flow and but it it, that's a big one and i try to be thematic i try to make it all a theme whether that's with the colors themselves or it has to be like a uniform thing i want people to see it and be like okay this this makes sense like um it's not just totally out there but there's some structure to it that resonates with them like like for example like the dustpan pour i did with rogue which was a painting two times ago it looked like very alien like and so i wanted to use a green halo because green and alien seems to work well together Sure. So I want there to be a consistent theme, like as like a as like a product almost that they're like, okay, I I feel that I resonate with that. Nice. So are you thinking about it um, as well as like like bef- before you start, you you want it to be cohesive because people. I mean, we like cohesiveness. I think some t- something about like distracted overworked and busy paintings or even busy anything like a dense forest even it it disrupts our psychological makeup we like order yeah yeah absolutely well allow even it, even if it's chaotic right yeah yeah no totally um and obviously you want both but like yeah you want it to be too orderly like dude here's a, here's maybe an example i noticed my paintings were getting too like digital looking and I wanted to have a lot more, um, a lot more organic looking motion. So for that last piece, beyond the algorithms, I started off with a brush stroke that instead of being such a perfect amount of like wet paint on the brush, that would just make it look like a linear gradient. I wanted there to be that feathering effect of the brush mm-hmm. to show that the painting isn't just this digital looking thing. It has brush strokes, almost like bird feathers. And when you combine it with the digital effects, it just unlocks people's like mind of like, oh, there's this effect and this effect. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, so it seems like there's a theme of, of balance going on. I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. And you were talking about balancing like work and life earlier um, with, with like set time boundaries which I think is really smart. And I think, I think artists can benefit from that because in my own experience, I've learned that it's more about a healthy, consistent rhythm rather than like a mad outpouring of one night of genius. And then you, you're like, Oh man, maybe that that was the best painting I ever made. And then you come back the next day and you're like, you, you feel a little bit differently about it now that you're, looking at it rather than in in the process of making it yeah absolutely man it's like the fresh eyes and like i was saying earlier like we have needs biologically and if we blow through those because we're just hyper focused on something that we can miss details we can rush we can it's just going to create more rework in the future we're not going to be happy with the end result you just have to like be patient work hard be focused and just have the end goal in mind Mm -hmm. do you resonate with that some yeah more and more now i think when i was an artist just starting out i thought that i could you know just sort of 
uh, <laughs> slap it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, figure it out. I mean, if you were to look at a lot of my stuff from, I think around s seven years ago is sort of where I started to get some shit together. Um, but yeah, anything before that is just a lot of it's busy. A lot of it's overworked. Um, there was this sort of feeling of like this painting, you know what I mean? Like this is the one. Right. Right. And, and I think that's sort of like a fallacy of, of creativity thinking that like what you're working on now is going to be the life defining masterpiece yeah. of, of all time. And I think that, uh, artists are sort of portrayed like that in, in media like oh you know when people talk about um you know post how do you say it posthumanist work uh, of people like you know dali or picasso or whoever they they tend to use like flowery language mm -hmm. like this was the defining moment in his career right cubism but really he needed to pump out Picasso in particular needed to pump out work from the blue period and, and needed all that, uh, training in like classical art making to, you have to know the rules to break the rules, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's all kind of this like journey rather than, hmm, you know, thinking this is the one. And I, I think a lot of artists are influenced by just that kind of an idea that's out there. Dude, yeah. And God, I resonate with that so much. Like when I finish a piece, I really think it is the end all be all. This is like my my opus piece. This is my, uh, and, and when the gallery, like, so I, I'm partnered with Red 8 Gallery and we have a defined pricing structure, but I always try to go like up and up and up because I'm like, my work's getting more technical. I love this piece. It's my best one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like, no, man, you got to keep the pricing the same. Like, <laughs> and like every piece and then like give it a week and I'll look back at the piece and I'll be like, okay, this is in line with some linear progress. This isn't some huge step jump, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. And like, what else you said, you said how like people will analyze some famous artists, you know, result, but really the artist's intention from the beginning was different than what society is like analyzing it as. And I think that's funny too. Yeah, I mean, that's the cool thing about art, right? Is that everybody gets to have their own hot take, if you will, of especially with abstract what it means to them. We're like almost making nothing. Like I get comments sometimes, which are like a good reality check. It's like, bro did a whole lot of nothing or like bro created <laughs> just the most awesome nothing. And I'm like, I kind of like that because like, yeah. I don't even really want it to be something. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't need to be, you know. It's how you feel, man. It's it's how you, uh, it's whatever you feel when looking at it. Like mm -hmm. all my work is is seriously, like whatever you think it is is the right answer. You know, I'm just I'm just creating energy. I'm just I'm just trying to create forms that introduce a new idea to people that I don't even know what I'm trying to do. Sometimes it just happens, and it's so cool to explore that in myself. Like this whole process of making art feels like an uncovering of who I am and finding my style. And it's happening very subconsciously. Yeah. What have you, what have you learned about yourself through making art? Oh man. Um, what am I, what have I learned about myself while making art? I've learned that like, I feel really confident when I'm, when I'm, when I'm doing it, it I feel like cool. I know that's like kind of cringy, <laughs> but like, I feel like, <laughs> like, you know, the word steez, like it's, Oh yeah kind of corny or whatever but like i feel like just there's like this style that's like i'm so I, i'm glad i have that like because i in high school i wasn't like a cool kid you know like i mm -hmm. i was good at shot putting discus and i had some like popularity because of that but like i always wanted to be the guy rocking like the fashion brands and like the hundreds and like crooks mm -hmm. and castles whatever brands were popular at the time but i never mm -hmm. could and so like just realizing that i have this art style in me is so cool and like I've just learned that I, I was cool all along. I just could never figure out the medium for it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. The, the whole cool conundrum is like, yeah. if you try to be cool, you end up being corny as hell. And if you just realize that like everybody, we're all a little bit corny and you just like can relax and be yourself. That's when 
that's when you're cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, you learn that in college, especially like, sure. Yeah. Classic trope of like the high school kids who, um, never really grow up and cause they don't really have that experience after high school. And then you go back to see your high school friends and sometimes it's like, Oh man, you didn't really grow up. And sometimes mm-hmm. college provides that opportunity to find yourself and whatever. But I mean, there's tons of different paths for people. Sometimes it does. Other times yeah. <laughs> people just, yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've been, uh, I, I love exploring, I think more than anything. Yeah. Um, as I grow older, I think that that's, that's been kind of my, the thing that makes me tick is just like, exploring a a new state when I moved out to Colorado and Mm -hmm. with art, I like to explore different motifs and, and, uh, styles, I guess, over the years. Yeah. Um, but I think some people just get to a spot and they're just like, yeah, I like it here. Yeah. And they just stay there and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, because that leaves more weird exploring to do for the rest of us, I guess. Yeah. I'm a, I guess I'm a little bit of both. My, my wife loves to travel a lot and I love to kind of go along with her and I learn a lot through the process, but like, I'm kind of a homebody. Like I, I love staying home. I love my routine. You know, I love just playing with the dog, going for a bike ride, you know, making yeah. cool art. Like I'm, I can do that forever. And it, it's bad because then I isolate myself from people and then I get super weird and it'll do like a social interaction after like two weeks of not doing it. <laughs> just you're not on the same wavelength, you know, but I know the feeling, trust me. Um, I, yeah, I, um, it's weird. You know, I was talking about that rebellious streak in me and, um, you know, sort of like, what would, what would you say? Dove into the psychedelic festival music, our community, whatever for most of my adult life. And, um, and now I'm like, well, Everybody around me is in, in no shame. I love it. I am it to a, to an extent. Uh, you know, my, my social click is, um, about kind of like smoking weed and being free and just Mm -hmm. going to festivals, having a good time. And I think the most rebellious, I'm like, oh, okay, well, how do I rebel against (laughs) the thing that I was, supposedly going towards to rebel against normal society it's like and now it's come back full circle like oh there are some things about normal society that are okay i guess uh you know i'm i'm getting married finally uh next next year next august sweet man congrats and uh, yeah thank you thank you i appreciate that and i just think it's it's kind of a rebellious act i guess uh in some ways yeah that is funny i I love the quote that which resists persists and i think um the thing that is is it's like you said the rebellious thing and then you calm down and go back to it later in life i think that's such an interesting concept yeah um so yeah i i took us on a you know weird tangent didn't even let you get a, a word in there oh, you're good i mean you're talking <laughs> about festivals and psychedelics and stuff too and um that's like a i wouldn't say psychedelics are a huge influence for my art yet like i've done psychedelics and i absolutely hate them and love them because you go through mm. a lot of shit to come out the other end as like a more open-minded person but you know i'm i would love to use psychedelics when i'm in that like vision like conceptualizing stage of my art and like I think I'm going to start trying that actually. Um, mm-hmm. But, and then festivals, obviously I'm a huge fan. I'm wearing, I'm wearing my Elenium seven lions and uh, excision. <laughs> nice. Oh the yeah. The whole community, like the whole like plur scene, like I don't like calling it that, but whatever it is, I mean, just people are amazing there. Like I went to a country, yeah. a country concert for the first time uh, a week ago, so, uh, you know, being there for my friend who's like, you know, she was like an earlier set, but she won a competition to be there and nice. country vibes. Are, it's great. Like I just, I realized in that moment, I just love being around people listening to music. Yeah. At the same time, like people listening to country is way different than people listening to like electronic music. Like everyone in country is just kind of in their own world side by side. No one's lifting their hands up. No one's talking to each other in the crowd. <laughs> I was like, damn, I missed that too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I realized that last week. 
what uh who is like who is headlining the country thing i probably exactly. don't know them uh god some something pretty john pretty pr- pr- john john prime no he's he's sorry he's no longer with us okay know. eric church was the next day mm. yeah you i don't know him? any of those guys no no they're big i think they're like kind of b-list maybe not a-list according to my friend but um it was a pretty big thing yeah fifty thousand people wow yeah yeah can you imagine live painting at one of those things Dude, I've heard you talk to people and you, you yourself did it. And uh, you know what's so funny is Bobby Cruz, who I've kind of become social media friends with. He He's like, dude, nice. paint with me. And I was like, <laughs> bro, I'd be so nervous to do that. Are you kidding me? Like, no way. <laughs> like, it made me feel comfortable like like I could. But I'm like, my type of art's different. I, I'm not going to get out a bunch of masking tape around people. Like, <laughs> I mean, I mean, people do. You know, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, people tape stuff up all the time. Like, um, yeah, you're familiar with Further, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, those guys. I mean, Oliver. I've I've watched Oliver Vernon, basically at a. I think it was a Clips Festival. Mm-hmm. He spent one day just taping stuff off. Oh wow! Yeah, it I was really wild. It was. I was like, that takes so much patience from my standpoint because, oh, dude, especially at that time, I I was just about just like. Mm-hmm. you know like going for it making making stuff up as i go along but it's i i admire i admire all most forms of creation i guess uh um and but especially that to have the the patience and the sort of like foresight i guess uh to to just spend one whole day in front of people on a big mural um just taping stuff up i was just I was just like, yeah, you know. Uh, but yeah, like we were saying about like live painting. Um, did did you ever, you did live painting, right? I've seen like videos. I still do from time to time, yeah. I mean, not so much anymore. Um, I think I, I got a little too burnt out on it uh, for a while. So I do maybe two or three, four gigs a year. Uh, right. I, I live paint every year at Electric Forest. That's... Uh, the one festival I will still uh, go to because it's, I guess, financially feasible to go there. Uh, right. It's kind of guaranteed, but not guaranteed, but guaranteed that you're going to make some money. The sales, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think the reason I got burnt out, and I've discussed this so much, so apologies to longtime listeners, but like, is that I would go go to festivals and work my butt off and come out like in the in the red you know being like god damn i lost 200 Mm -hmm. bucks this weekend um and there there's some that i would go to um just to go and some that still treat artists really well like secret dreams treated me really well last year i went there um they they they're sort of run the the art department is run by artists so they get it um nice. i want to make it down to astronox which is where our mutual friend bobby is this weekend Sweet. shout out shout out bobby shout out bobby he's yeah he's the best man i i'll take a few minutes here to big up bobby i'm not a, a surprised at all that you're online friends with him um yeah but online friends so true yeah He's just, he's one of the friendliest people that I know and one of the kindest. Um, your first guest, right? I was looking through your list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that boy can talk too. So, I mean, that's, I think, pr- partially why uh, I wanted him on as as the first guest. And he just has interesting interesting stories too, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm nervous about live. Can I ask with live painting, do you... Um... How much are you free forming versus how much are you uh, pretty much going in with a planned concept? Because I'd be worried about people touching my shoulder, people wanting to interact, and I'm so like, get away from me, I'm painting. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. So to your question about how much is planned versus how much is, is free form, these days, I like going in with a plan. Mm-hmm. Um, at Electric Forest this year, I made a a blender, basically a three D render in the the program called Blender. Yeah, yeah. 
familiar. And I, before we left, you know, it's like a 24 hour car ride takes two days to get there um, mm. from Colorado. Before we left, I projected that image onto my canvas, you know, traced it with um, a, a paintbrush so that it wouldn't, you know, if I were to trace it with chalk, it would have, I would have risked it like disintegrating. Bleeding, showing through. Oh, disintegrating. Okay. Yeah. And, and then when I got to electric forest, I just had my, uh, reference photo and I just, and I had my paints pre-mixed. And so it went from just this outline to sort of like pretty much all the way filled in nice. in the course of like three or four days. That seems like the perfect way to do it because people can still watch you and you will be less bothered because you've already got the vision. Now you're just executing the mission. At a place like Electric Forest, especially because it's a a near constant deluge of people wanting to either talk or buy prints and, and canvases from you. Yeah. And so that helps a lot. And I, I need to shout out the, uh, the build crew at electric forest, uh, cheese and dollar bill, my, my boy free who got me in. Yeah. They cheese and he built, he built this, like, it's kind of like a, it looks like a little petting zoo pin, mm -hmm. um, where we paint. And then he built this awesome structure called the hive with all these hexagons, uh, all through it. We can put little, uh, succulents and plants in the hexagon things. And, uh, it just looks really, really nice. So there's like a, what I'm trying to say is there's a, there's a small little fence that sort of like, uh, fences us off a little bit at electric forest in particular, but yeah, I feel you like certain styles lend themselves to just go and going wild and dancing with the music in the middle of the crowd. Like I've done that before. And, um, I would probably do it again under the right circumstances, but I really do. Uh, I've been enjoying this new, uh, new phase in my life, I guess, where I'm, I'm a bit more methodical with things. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, man. That's cool. Yeah. You should give it a try sometime, man. You might like it. I don't know. It, you, you would probably have to at least have your your gradient or background done yeah you know? i need but dude like you're saying like if you just have like a projected white background with your i use like a hard pencil but still shows through the paint sometimes luckily the airbrush mm -hmm. covers decently but have a reference photo have a little airbrush i mean on a big canvas too that's actually that'd be super fun dude because i love festivals like electric forest is one i've been wanting to do forever and mm -hmm. it just hasn't lined up i've done edc twice um, which is, I don't know, a little different now. I feel it's like, like a little harder, like the base pod stage is just growing and growing and it's way more dubstep and, and rhythm and that wonky stuff that just makes you want to like thrash your head. Yeah. Yeah. What's, is that like, uh, what are, what are some of your like outside influences? Um, I mean, it can also be artists as well. Uh -huh. Um, but I usually, you know, movies, books, music, art um anything that comes to mind yeah like um if we're on the festival topic like one of my dreams has been to incorporate my art somehow with certain artists like like subtronics and excision obviously pretty mainstream dubstep mm -hmm. artists but like when i see their stage their stage presence and their visuals and these explosive abstract forms and these like accelerating stuff coming at you i'm like that inspires my work. Like when I was watching Excision, that was one of my favorite sets. And I'm just like, dude, how can I work this into my art? I would love to somehow make their album art or do something like that. Like that would be a, that's a huge dream of mine. Um, so yeah, that kind of music. Um, when I'm bike riding and I'm just like listening to music, like, you know, whether it's drum and bass or some like funk type stuff, or even like dubstep, electronic, whatever, like, and I'm just like, carving through trails, doing little jumps, like that energy, um, is, is the coolest feeling to me. And I don't know if that like inspires my work. That's just something I really love doing. And like that kind of energy is, I think that same thing that I bring to my paintings when I'm making them. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was, I, I just have the, the word <laughs> biomechanics 
in like capital letters here on my notes. Okay. And you mentioned you were track and field. You you threw discus, shot put. I mean, a lot of your work is very like it just has this nice feel where it looks like you're like you've embodied those types of activities or or just some kind of like feeling of like surfing or flowing gliding along it that seems to me to be a, a big part of your work dude i'm actually this is the first time i've had like a art conversation with someone for longer than like 20 minutes like mm-hmm. about like the specifics of my work because like friends will usually just you know they'll like we'll talk about art for five minutes and it'll be like social media stuff and the business side of stuff but like it's yeah. you're making shit go off in my head i'm like okay wait yeah my track and field background my like my motion my my animation stuff that accelerating stuff that i just love doing of course that's in my work and like you're right i design around that initial organic motion and mm. that is like a forever captured moment in time that i want to design around and amplify and complement and that's why i think like maybe that's why i'm like kind of blowing up online is like people see that as like a new style that that hasn't happened before and it feels so personal to me and I, that's what i love about it um man I've, I've actually never thought about that i'm glad you brought that up there's there's an artist her name is i think cat katrin katrin fredericks oh, oh i love her work oh my yeah, gosh yeah. those but like, I, throws that she does holy yeah 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 it reminds me a lot of, of some of the stuff that you do but i think her her tagline and her bio is something like um capturing velocity or something like that and yeah i think that 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 sparked me to sort of ask that question i guess is uh a lot of um a lot of that work feels like sort of an embodied like sort of zen tai chi movement that may be inspired by like physical activity like my friend zach jackson had a has a lot of work like that it's more it's more like precise uh uh, detailed stuff nowadays but he had a ratio zj ratio yep i love stuff yeah but yeah just this like sort of capturing this zen moment of like feeling those those bristles on the canvas you know or or i guess i like to i like to capture energy that's like uh, a representation of how I'm feeling in that moment. And, mm-hmm. um, and like, I'll spend a lot of time practicing about what that motion is and about what I'm going for and about, and I'll even take video kind of like what I did track and field. I would take video of myself and then I'd analyze it at back engineer. Why is this happening? Really? What it is, what is the result from this effort here? Awesome. So I'm pretty comfortable doing that. I do like a lot of like technique ratio, paint ratio type stuff where it's like 75% versus 60% water mm-hmm. or this pouring medium or this amount of silicone, uh, at least back in the older days. But like I take like a very like structured technical approach to try to get the exact effect I want. And like Katrin Fredericks, for example, she does not show her process um, yet. I'm sure everyone would love to see how the hell she does that. Um. But that plus like someone like Costas, I don't know if you're familiar with Costas. I don't think, not off the top of my head, at least. He does these big brush strokes, probably like, you know, like my big ass three foot brush. Yeah. Um, I think I got that from from him, actually. I, I saw him doing these, cr- and this all happens within two seconds. It's just this cool flowing form. And he'll call one of his paintings like Secrets of the Sea. And I just like, damn, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. And so integrating that technique plus Kat and Frederick's technique plus like the neon stuff. And I just want to see if I combine all these like really cool instantaneous elements of art, like what is possible? And that's, I like to call it action painting, even though like Mm -hmm. Jackson Pollock was considered action painting. But like, but like my action is maybe different. Maybe it's velocity painting. So I'm trying to figure out that identity too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, the words that we put to genres of either music or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, it would be cool to sort of create your own. Yeah. I would, I would say, like, um, it's hard to categorize stuff for me sometimes. Um, I know, like, but you- action painting sounds great, but I guess you said Jackson Pollock already sort of has that 
put his flag. If you look up action painting on Google. It's it's the splattery freestyle stuff, but there's not much like intention to it. I feel, and there's not much story right. to it. It's not thematic, and so you know, I like the I like maybe acceleration because I love the feeling that that growing of going from zero to 100 in an accelerating way and like i think a lot of my work shows that with the splatters like the only the last 20 percent of the dustpan throw is the really organic thing that happens in midair that like a, mm -hmm. a human would like struggle to conceptualize or like paint by hand and that's like where the magic of it is and i love to amplify that and design around it and utilize that into the work and and also like not overwork it. Like a huge thing I've learned is that if you try to overwork stuff, it's going to have inconsistent energy. And there's something really special about that initial intuition that you design around. And um, that's why I do all the practice attempts leading up to it. Nice, nice. Do you play disc golf at all? This is going to be a hard left turn, but uh, no, you ever play disc golf. golf? I, I could see myself liking it. I play real golf pretty unsuccessfully, but yeah, I'm pretty unsuccessful at disc golf, but, um, you're talking about throwing discus on uh, track and field. And then also you were talking about taking little practice shots with your, uh, with your paintbrush. Um, right. and so it made me think of, uh, all the unsuccessful practice shots I've been taking, uh, recently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, I think I see like Steven Cruz. Uh like he like designs some of them maybe or I don't know if it was him. He or plays. Something. He definitely he plays, plays and he has some discs out there, I'm sure. Um nice. Yeah, I mean it's fun as hell just to take a completely non artsy topic. Uh but yeah, it's kind of I guess I, I could tie it back in with that sort of like when you really toss a good disc it's sort of like that fluid motion of, of making a really expressive brush stroke. There's mm -hmm. no, it's not forced, uh, but there's enough, there's enough power behind it to make it meaningful. And maybe you came very, very close to the target. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good metaphor. <laughs> yeah. I'm trying, I'm trying over here. I'm stringing it all together. Yeah. No, um, I like it. love it. Okay, so I did want to ask you, um, you sort of alluded to it a couple times about, I mean, you blew up instantly on social media, it seems like. What are your strategies with it? Uh, we can talk about, you know, for me, I'm, I think I'm just so over it that it comes in waves, right? I'll be like over it and then I'll make some reels and gain some momentum and then um, I'll stop again, which I think is probably not the best strategy, but yeah. How do you, how do you strategize with it? What's your, and then how do you balance it with, you know, you mentioned like turning off the phone at the end of the night or like not thinking about art. Um, absolutely. Um, how do you approach it? So I, I, I have to acknowledge that there's a little bit of luck, probably a lot of luck with, at least my follower account and like going viral. Mm -hmm. um, I started Instagram August, 2021. And that was at the exact same time that Instagram reels was pushing from Instagram as a way to insert ads into their videos. They found that had to have better engagement. So of course they make more money if people make more reels. Right. I had one video blow up. I had, a, I had maybe 800 followers, which very normal to have after six months. Mm -hmm. And I, I put a Tyler, the creator lyric, <laughs> of him just talking in an interview saying, I usually just make shit that I like. People's brains just interpret it however way they want to. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it's just me doing a dustpan on this like trash canvas that I had. Shit got like 2 million views, 3 million views. And of course, overnight, 10, 10K followers, wow. right? So does that mean that I'm a, an, like an amazing artist? Hell no, it's like the opposite. I got lucky with the algorithm. But then, right, like, that at the same time that that's happening, I'm also like really trying to learn art and push my art techniques. And I get like, okay, I a little imposter syndrome. It's like, okay, wait, oh my God, I got 10K followers. And I'm, this is amazing. What a validating thing. Just, you know, and, and so I really just started pushing my techniques and eventually started making like legit art where I would incorporate that kind of things I've learned through like the, um, through the algorithm throughout that time about what makes it hit, which I'll be happy to share. 
Um, and then I eventually just started making better and better pieces and process videos and stuff, which has kind of become part of my brand. It's like showing the process start to finish. Um, and I, so kind of my formula is like, I only keep the most aesthetic clips in there. Um, because it's less important that people know every single step of the process. It's more important that they're engaged in the video. If yeah. we're talking purely retention, right? I mean, this is like marketing ideas. This is like nothing to do with art, honestly. And so like, I've always kind of been like, I, I'm a big YouTube guy, kind of introverted. I love listening to podcasts. I love, you know, listen to Mr. Beast, like Mr. Beast's mm -hmm. And I just, I love that idea of engagement and stuff. And like, I'm probably contributing to the whole ADHD society where we all are, bro. Like, let's be real. If it, You have to be like completely hermit cut off from everybody. Yeah. I don't just as a tangent, I don't like it when people want to place blame on individuals for shit like this, even if you're blaming yourself, you know what I mean? Like, don't do that. That's like, we're all just, we're all swept up in the, torrent of history you know what i mean like yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah, i'm no yeah. og in the art space like i know that sometimes instagram was pushing static posts like seeing stuff yeah yeah like thirty thousand likes for a single static post and like mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen anymore and so you the algorithm itself is just changing what to whatever fits their their pockets the best right and so right. I happen to be a person that likes making videos too like i used to make scooter trick videos with my brothers i used to you know, make like, like even like music videos and animated fight scenes and stuff like that to music. Like that's something that I've always been interested. It's like part of the creation journey for me. So like some of the art is the real for me. And I know mm -hmm. not all artists feel that way. Now it's I think that's cool. Like I, I don't, sorry to interrupt you. I think that's cool. It's like um, a lot of people are, are a bit purist in the way that they conceptualize art and creativity. And I'm, I mean, I've been guilty of that before for sure, but I'm consciously trying to, to, you know, I mean, I've made reels that I've enjoyed making to be yeah. quite honest. Um, and I, I just, it's hard for me to sort of have a, uh, cohesive brand and I don't really have the, either the marketing background or the, the sort of business acumen, I guess, to, <laughs> to create a uh, a solid brand out there like i said i think that i struggle with identity and i'm sort of obsessed with this idea that identity is uh just provisional and and ego is is a thing that we created to know yeah. know who's whose mouth to put the food in at dinner yeah totally <laughs> man like uh, who i am online is is what i want everyone to see sure you know and, that, and then i'm a person at home like uh, you know, working through my own problems, um, as a, as a human. And then I've got a very, you know, happy relationship and family life and friend life and stuff. And I don't want to show that to my art page. Like that's a whole separate thing. And then, that, then I got my art brand and like, I keep it very structured because I like to give people the user experience of looking at Nick Boltman art, seeing the thing, you know, seeing all the posts I made, swiping aside, seeing all the videos. Like I very consciously like have engineered a, uh experience for them to just quickly absorb my art so that they could want to share it they could tell their friends about it and ultimately it's all with the end goal of me just spreading my my artistic you know brand and image and art art itself to mm -hmm. the most amount of people and so i found the algorithm to be the thing that does that so it's important to learn and i think a lot of artists are are either scared of it or feel jaded or they're not seeing the success through the algorithm. And that's totally fair. I was at, I was at the same amount of TikTok views and followers for a whole year. And then I had a, vid a video blow up two weeks ago. They got 20 million views Damn. for the stupidest video, bro. Like it was, it was my wife and I's five year anniversary, right? Mm -hmm. Before getting in the shower, I, uh, we were about to go to like some nice dinner. And um, before I came in the shower, I picked the number one trending sound on TikTok. And it was that really stupid sound, but like, let him cook, let him cook. You yeah. know, like, yeah, you heard yeah. that one? Yeah. And it was just a transition of me doing the dustpan to like this, you know, this pan out of this, you know, that five foot long beyond the algorithms piece I made. Mm -hmm. Shit blew up like crazy. And I was like, I put zero effort into that. And it just happened to be something that hit. And I've posted 40 videos in the past year and none of those hit, but they were the same things that were hitting on Instagram. 
So if you mix your Instagram, your TikTok, your Snapchat, your Facebook, your Reddit, even, mm-hmm. I know Reddit's kind of frowned upon. You're not really supposed to do too much self promo, but like, I and YouTube, right? Like, I just yeah. I want to get big, so I'm willing to do that. So I'm my own marketing manager. Hell yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think a lot of success in the art world, um, or on the internet at least, you have to sort of embrace the marketing. Uh, side of it and you have to just keep keep working it's all about momentum really is sort of sort of what i've learned oh totally dude and like i've learned recently like i was doing a lot of show promo on instagram and i found just to get a lot less engagement because i think when people get to the end what's the call to action go to a show in london no one's (laughs) going to share that like yeah yeah what do people share they share a single you know, piece of art, start to finish, they feel like they completed the journey by watching it. They feel good. You know, they want to share that. They like the end result. They like the feeling they went through and that's way different. And so now Instagram saw me as a guy that was getting 50 K views per video where I'm used to like 500. Mm -hmm. And it, it took me like a few videos after that to start getting back up into that, that range I was used to. And so, like you said, the inconsistency, I think Instagram part of the algorithm is biased towards like, almost like you have to be making like cinematic masterpieces like once every week or two just yeah, to be yeah. on the radar to get that momentum. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, dude. It's like, it's absolutely crazy. I I have a technical question about this. What kind of camera are you using? Are you just using your phone camera or do you have like... iPhone 14 Pro. Nice. With the Oliver Vernon background. Hey, nice. Um, yeah. I have an iPhone seven S. Uh, so it's a little, <laughs> Time a little to upgrade, outdated. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I think I have a big, I have a big paycheck coming in. So, uh, I might, yeah. I might invest in that. Um, it really helped, but yeah, yeah. You so you just put it on a tripod and, um, just go to town with it. Yeah. Or even, you know, hold it to my chest and do some mundane activity, like an airbrush stroke or whatever, pulling off masking tape, yeah. Um, but kind of like what Mr. B says, like one of the parts of the formula is all about like a hook, you know, uh, retention and watch time, and then some kind of um, cathartic moment at the end mm-hmm. where there's some kind of uh, reason for people to watch that they gained from the video. Yeah. Right? Like the and finished. Like, yeah. Yeah. Usually a finished piece, usually it's super aesthetic. You know, people do get mad if you don't show the full piece enough. You know, some people like flash it at the very end for a second. And then you got comments like, oh, I wish the artist showed the whole thing. You know, so like kind of just and think about like the videos you like watching, you know, and Mm -hmm. obviously some of them are like kind of cornball or whatever with trending sounds and stuff. But like really feel like, why did I watch that to the end and then kind of back engineer that and apply it to your own art? And that's a formula for getting success online, I think. Hell yeah. Yeah. Thanks for breaking that down for us. Absolutely. I do. It's like, I think, you know, I've, I've heard it before. I'm sure other people have heard similar things before, but for me, especially it's like hearing these things repeated over and over again is it's about for me, remembering Mm -hmm. more than it is say like, rather than just being like, okay, I've got to make a reel, just like throwing a reel together thinking about these things from the principles rather than like just being like, Oh, Instagram wants me to make a reel. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've noticed that when I sort of put a little bit more effort into it, uh, it tends to get a bit more traction than it normally would. Yeah. I I hate when Instagram does that. It's like make a reel out of your highlights. The cornball feature that isn't going to give me engagement in the first place. Yeah. Like imagine pushing this on people and then, disappointing them with the lack of views it's just like you know they don't i don't know it's super cringy like that instagram even pushes that sometimes yeah yeah well i i would hope that people understand i guess the sort of flip side to social media at this point um in terms of i mean where do we start like uh misinformation and uh you know comparison with 
other people and sort of your social circles and just all these things not being that great for you. Um, but since, since we're artists, you know, we're sort of, uh, beholden to, to participate, I guess. So, um, yeah, I guess it just bears repeating that, like, you know, don't doom scroll too much. Totally. After Dude, I it. see it as a vehicle to, to growing my art career. I don't see it as like a representation of who I am as a person, et cetera. I mean, if people saw my art and then like compared it to theirs, they don't see that I put in 120 hours. They don't see the really mundane mask and they don't see me sweating in my garage, losing 10 pounds because I'm like hustling so hard to get this done. Like I've gotten so emotional. I've like cried after pieces before. Nice. Like, this little polished video for people. <laughs> and yeah, it's, it's just like any other social media page, you know, if you're comparing your looks to someone or et cetera, like you don't know that person's reality. And, um, it's just good to keep in mind. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Yeah. I've had this idea that I don't think I'll ever pull the trigger on. So I'll just share it. Um, of making an Instagram or a TikTok called like the anti highlight reel and just, <laughs> just showing, just showing being stuck in traffic or waiting in a line or like, yeah, a, a, a rough emotional time or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's like just, fail blog without being so sensationalized. It's like more mundane. Sure. Yeah, just the the mundane brushing my teeth, you know, like. <laughs> I love it. Shit like that. Uh, so maybe someone can take that idea and run with it. I would, I, I need no credit. I would only like to to see that out there in the zeitgeist, even though if it's a it's a small grain of sand pushing against a, a mountain of, of highlight reels. Um. CAF of the caption and then you repost it and then it goes viral and then you're like, oh really shit, this big brand, I got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be too ironic. Well, that's what I think about the podcast that I I I like, uh, that I missed when I wasn't doing it all these months uh, was that it's just a built-in brand where I, I'm just talking. You know, it's, it doesn't take, doesn't take that much to sort of build a brand identity, I guess. I don't know. It's just an ex exploratory podcast with artists and even sometimes not, not visual artists, you know, like the last two podcasts I did were with uh, a musician and a comedian. Yeah. So, so I've been right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my boy. Yeah. You guys, you guys seem like good friends. It was, it's always cool to see like, like people that are homies, like doing a pod together. Like that's like, I think those are like some of the best pods. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We cracked some jokes. It was a good time. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Oh man. I had a question for you. I forgot to write it down. I know I even warned you that I might be looking away, writing stuff down. Biomechanics. Um, <laughs> yeah. Bi biomechanics. Yeah. Um, well, if there's a, if you were thinking about some, can I, uh, do you want to be the first person to see my brand new piece I'm releasing tomorrow? Yeah. I've been, I've been, is that it behind you? No, this is an old canvas okay. print. Actually. Okay. But, okay. Um, I'll be right back. All right. Check it out. Oh, sick. Hang on. T talk so I can see it. Okay. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I just have the setting to. <laughs> to jump over to me when I talk and jump back to you when you're talking. Wow. Ah. <laughs> tell tell me about this piece. Dude, this is, this is, it started with a big fluid background of kind of just that every color except for green type thing. I really like like the blues and oranges and then how they mix together. And then I just basically added a bunch of like very precise features to be this coherent landscape of like, I'm trying to think of names and um, I have two in mind. The first one was going to be Chroma Zone and it's spelled mm. C-R-O-M-A, like Chroma. Yeah. yeah. And Zone, Z-O-N-E, like, um, like it's a zone, like it's a landscape, like it's an environment. My wife hated it, but I thought it was like a cool play on words. And then uh, the other one would be Hero Dose. So it's like taking okay. a giant yeah, yeah. You know, dose yeah. and it's like, this is. Was that in, was that inspired? Uh, was 
this painting inspired by that? No. In particular? Oh, okay. No. I I would eventually want to start playing with that kind of stuff. Yeah. How it inspires, but like I just I don't know. I I love it. It's pretty trippy. It's awesome, man. Thanks, dude. Yeah, good job. Yeah, you're you know, you're pushing you're pushing your own style there. I like it. I like it. I'm trying. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to see how far I can go. I want I I like chromosome. I'm a I'm a huge nerd for puns. I like it. Good. Just and, just to put my two cents in there. Well, honestly, dude, I appreciate it. I was wife, so but... excited. <laughs> I was so excited when I thought of it and I texted her right. <laughs> she shot it down. That's okay. We oh. usually don't actually agree on like a lot of uh a lot of like the naming and artistic stuff. So sometimes it's a, if she doesn't agree, it's like, okay, maybe this makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I like the painting a lot too, man. Good job. Very good. Very nice. Do you um, remember the question? No, I I was curious. Uh, usually I ask this question like way earlier, but I think you you sort of alluded to it. Do you have do you have any sort of practice outside of you know waking up early, um, and then working for you know a solid eight to ten hours, and then cutting yourself off? Do you have any other practices that that help you? that just help your brain chemistry to stay motivated and, 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 and working all the time. Dude. Yeah. Now that you, I mean, this conversation is like totally opened my mind up to like the fact that the biomechanics of my work are so important to be mm -hmm. smooth and effective and powerful. And that's why I work out. I've grown up working out and I, yeah. I swear by it for mental health and just for feeling like confident in the world. And so um, my wife and I do a lot of hot Pilates where they blast the room up to 103 degrees and we just yeah. let our asses off doing movements. And it's amazing. Um, when I wasn't injured, I was doing a lot of power cleans and bench press and a lot of like fast twitch muscle movement type stuff. And, um, so yeah, working out, it's a big one. Another big one for me is like, like just socializing and getting out of my own head, putting my individual obsession to the side and just interacting with people in like a healthy way and like integrating myself into a social circle so that when I come back to my obsession, I have just like a blank slate for all my creative impulses yeah. to come back. Yeah. That's super important. I mean, I think both those things are super important. Um, especially, especially socializing with people because you don't want to be, I guess, sitting in your own bath water for too long. <laughs> uh, cause I, I, I've been there, you know, like, and I, I've also been on the other side of, uh, I guess I've just not worked out for a lot of my adult life. And I, I picked that up recently. I'm not, I'm not hitting any big weights, but I'm doing a lot of, a lot of reps with, uh, the kettlebell that I have at home. Nice. Uh, it, it changed so much. It just, I don't know. It just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you just, for me personally, like, there's a lot of changes I made this year. Um, like I quit uh, vaping nicotine. And also on top of that, I started working out, doing like exercise bike and kettlebell mostly. Um, a little bit of journaling. Yeah, just going to bed on just simple shit, like going to bed when I need to and not pushing it and, and getting enough sleep. Just yeah. changed my life this year. I think it, I think I needed that after, uh, after sort of taking over a year off of the podcast and, and just sort of, you know, just sitting in my own bathwater essentially. Right. Yeah, man. It's like those simple routines that are, um, so habit forming eventually. And it just like creates so much fertile ground to have like a effective life. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, no, that's awesome, man. I'm happy for you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. And yeah, I, I just wanted to, reiterate that yeah i find i find working out to be extremely beneficial mostly for my brain i think yeah um, i don't know and my emotions um it's really helped a lot Dude, so, yeah. i'll be um, i'll be back in 10 seconds i need to turn the air up in my house okay getting hot in there yeah it's too cold actually oh too cold all right all right yeah but we had some insane weather in arizona this summer we were uh 
don't know if you heard like 45 days of 110 plus degree weather in a row. That is fucked. I know. No, no thank you. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> my, uh, I say to that. Yeah, my uh, my bushes in my front yard, which have been here for apparently 30 years, um, half of them have turned brown and I couldn't bring them back to life. So Damn. it just shows like these grandpa trees are, are very, uh, they got roasted. Damn. Yeah, that's wild. I mean, I live in a what I consider to be a dry climate here in Colorado. Um, but that must that just must be intense. It sounds just insane. Imagine like working in the garage. I was preparing for my show too, so I was sweating away like crazy. I had my dad come out. We were going to install a whole AC unit in the garage, and um, we ended up just getting a swamp cooler, which yeah. just pushes condense. It was like the perfect thing for Arizona. Oh yeah. Like yeah, it yeah. helps dry my paint when I'm doing like a dustpan pour. I need a day to dry it in the garage. It like keeps flies away. Mm-hmm. It was like the best investment for working in the garage in summer Arizona heat. Yeah, yeah. My old house had a had a swamp cooler <clears throat> rather than a, a an AC central air, I guess. Right. Um, and I loved it. Like at the end of the day, I could just blast it. We lived in a pretty small house. We could just blast it for like an hour. It would drop the temperature to like sleeping temps, which for me is like about 67, 68 degrees. Oh, wow. That's low. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Like I, um, I think I mentioned this in my last podcast, which will come out tomorrow. Um, but I, I treat my sleep now, like a lot of people with, food allergies or like um food restrictions treat their diet like everything just has to be kind of just so i'm very sensitive to like if i if i sleep in a hotel room the first night um i'm not really sleeping i'm like this is a new space there's something in deep in my brain that i have no control over that's like no we should probably stay awake you know we're it could be, you know, it could be a five star hotel and I would probably still get shit sleep Dude, um, that's because so funny. I'm just like new, new space, new space. All right. Yeah. And just you can't like, even like explain it. It's just like your body's doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it sucks, it's probably but... PMI, but like, I can't go number two when I'm on vacation, bro. Like three days. Really? go dude my body won't let me and then the second i get home you know pet my dog greet the dog within five minutes i'm, I'm on the toilet so it's like <laughs> it's funny how that love yeah. dude that's good podcasting right there that's good no uh, that we'll take it out if you want but like that <laughs> that's good i mean look i don't know um so we have uh my fiance's mom and her aunt are staying with us uh this week mm-hmm and we have a bidet, um, which I will die on the hill of like every American should fucking grow up and get a bidet. Like, what are we doing? Right. I think it's the best hygiene invention since probably like tampons or something or to- maybe even toilet paper. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. They're, they were like, oh, I'm wondering the like weird about hydrogen invention. Is it like I've never noticed like an issue with like the the traditional just you know toilet paper situation? Like, is it been well, like, have you noticed like benefits in other ways? Like, I know this is here high. we go, <laughs> here we go. Welcome to top tier podcasting, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, I mean, you use less toilet paper, that's for sure. That's one thing. Um, I think it helps with like what are those things called they're not hernias hemorrhoids hemorrhoids that's right you don't have to wipe you don't have to over wipe i guess i don't know i just i just find it more sanitary you know like i think america i think it's an american thing too to like be like something's touching my butt oh i don't want to be gay you know like i don't know like i think you're probably right anyway we might cut this i'll put this on the patreon i guess there you uh, go <laughs> <laughs> i remembered i did remember what i was going to ask you though um prepping for a solo show uh 
that's intense. I've come kind of close to that. I had like a trio show that I prepped for. It was still nuts. I think I had about five months to to finish a bunch as many paintings as I could essentially. And it was it was it was just nuts. I just remember losing sleep, staying up all night, being like, I'm gonna finish today, you know, like Yes. Yeah. That, that so, was me losing ten pounds in my garage on beyond the algorithms, mm -hmm. you know, rushing to get it out. I was still on timeline, but it was like Oh my gosh i i've never worked harder in my life yeah yeah, yeah. Um, it's so yeah just thinking about that and i was like there's times where i'm doing it i'm like fucking line by line and i was just like this is miserable but like every little step and i i, I have subscribers on instagram which i love just po i love doing work and posting it online just that's such a ritual for me i love mm -hmm. like having something to show for my progress on a day-to-day -day basis but I'm not going to show my main audience that because again, I care about branding and I want to show right. them a final reveal after there's been anticipation. Like I would love to share them with my main audience, but I just know that would be worse for engagement. And also like, I, I like to give, I like to give people a story to get behind. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I do that. I post to my subscribers and um, for five months, just like you, I, I was informed in March, 2023, that I would be having a show in September, 2023 and um just as crank out as many pieces as you can they wanted 15 i was able to get seven new ones mm -hmm. so they had to pull some of my old work which i had in inventory that had already sold um which is such an interesting thing we can talk about that too with my gallery but yeah yeah um, it was it was very much just like you're saying like wow just yeah i literally lost 10 pounds i didn't go to the gym i didn't do pilates i didn't do any of that because i was just sweating away so much every day yeah but yeah. the result you know showed it for itself I think that was one of my coolest paintings, I think. Oh, hell yeah, man. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's cool when, when you push yourself, what comes out, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, I think there's tricks too, to like giving yourself a deadline. Um, uh, even if you don't have a gallery show or anything, there's like this deadline that you have to hit. Yeah. And sometimes that'll, that'll push new, interesting or, or higher level things out. As um, long as you're not over the edge, like we were talking about earlier, because mm -hmm. like, because then you might make mistakes and then you got to rework and then you're going to post something you're not proud of. And then you're going to, you know, or something like that, right? That that's happened to me before specifically. So I've just been taking my time with this one, just like, yeah. I don't know, six hours a day instead of 10 hour days. And sure, sure. Yeah. Yep. It's been good. Yeah. Um, yeah. So about the show, it was in London, right? Mm -hmm. And the gallery is called Red Eight Gallery. It's a gallery. Yep. Okay. Nice. They're, uh, yeah, they're like an investment gallery, like a um, an art advisory. They they're like eighty percent blue chip, so like you know Banksy and Keith Haring and Damian Hurst and all like the really big names that sell for a ton of money. And then there's like emerging artists, which is I'm in that bucket. Um, a lot of like London based people, but then they've got a few you know over the pond people like me, <clears throat> and it's, it's interesting because I've got so many hats, you know, I've got wearing a suit at a gallery in London type hat. I've, I've got like, I'm a social media, you know, artist. And then now I'm also trying to find an art community. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I've also got my own personal life on the side of that. Yeah. But it was great, man. I've got, um, I had like I, my mom and dad flew out. I had like six friends fly out, make a trip out of it. You know, mom in law came and, um, Dude, I actually got sick the day of. I got a stress cold. Oh, man. It was yeah. wild. Because I was up two days before writing notes in my phone. Like, what am I doing here? Like, what what would make this a good show? And I was just, you should see the notes. It's like 30 pages, dude. And it's at <laughs> four in the morning. My wife's like, Nick, what? Now I'm up. Like, you're next to me and I can feel your energy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I ended up getting a stress cold from that the day of. And like, there was no AC in there. So it was like really sweaty. Mm. And I'm sick. And so I ended up just drinking a bunch of champagne and like it totally made it better <laughs> speech because I was like, I was too champagned out. I probably had like five glasses. And uh, it was so fun though, dude. It was just cool meeting with like investors as, as well as collectors that own my art. But mm -hmm. what's cool about Red 8 is um, if somebody purchases the art, 
um, I still get paid. And then they basically would, uh, they want to potentially resell it to see if they can get more for it in a secondary market. So Red A will facilitate that transaction as well. Interesting. Wait, so so if I were, if let's just say I wanted to buy a Nick Boltman painting mm -hmm. and I contacted you directly and I was like, here's $7,000 for your painting or whatever they go for. Um, then Red 8 would try and resell that painting even though I bought it or am I... Am I missing? What am I missing? Um, it's up to the customer if they want to go that route. Otherwise, they can just buy it outright, stick it in their home, or do okay. whatever with it. Got yeah. you, got you, got you, got you. That's pretty cool. That's, That's nice. Uh, yeah. yeah, man. It, they reached out to me like, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago. And I was super skeptical because it just sounded all too good to be true, right? And yeah. uh, and they've done everything they've said. I love working with them. And there's, there's no issues with being six, eight hours ahead. You know, we could talk over WhatsApp. I literally met them all for the first time, like at my show, nice. <laughs> which is a whole nother thing. Like, how is this going to go? Like, that's why I'm so stressed, man. That's why I was so stressed. I had no clue if my paintings arrived there on time or like damaged or anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wasn't hundred percent sure about the layout. I hadn't met the guys yet. And yeah, I was just so such a head case, but the day of, it was just it, the second I got there and like met everyone, it was just perfect. It was a great time. Nice. Yeah. It looked like it was a uh, success. So congratulations. That looked awesome. Yeah. To be like two years into the game and have like gallery representation is sick as hell. Thanks dude. Yeah. It's wild. I still am wrapping my head around it. What did it, what else do they, I guess, do they promote? your art other outside of your gallery show um, um yeah they've got you know a huge email list subscribers uh and then they've got a bunch of you know connections international art market you know charities auctions a bunch of like honestly just like wealthy people in a bunch of different random ways mm -hmm. and um they ultimately are always trying to push my art in, in any way you know they've got 10 artists under their belt i'm one of them if they're having a conversation with someone and they see there's, there's like some kind of need or opportunity, you know, they'll, they'll pitch my art. So they're basically an entire like sales team that, that goes out and tries to sell my art. And then occasionally I'll just get a message. Hey, this one sold I'm like, hell yeah. Nice. Nice. That's super rad. Do you have anything else coming up? Do you have uh, any more plans for, uh, for gallery shows or yeah, nothing in the works, man, but I, I want one so bad. I want yeah. to do something domestically. Like honestly, like Denver would be a sick spot. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Arizona, obviously. Um, and then California, I think those would be great options. Cause that's where all my friends and family are. The people that have been following me. Um, but I do have an exclusive with red eight technically, but I think they're open to letting me work with other galleries too. So I think when, that time comes, I think we could make something happen for sure. But I'm nice. excited for another show. I want to have something lined up in the yeah. next, I don't know, nine months to a year for sure. But other than that, I'm like looking at like brand deals and stuff like that eventually. But I'm trying to like tread carefully with that and figure out what sure. direction I want to take all that kind of stuff too. So but with, it's brand, with brand deals, are you, are you thinking about licensing or um, is that how you, the route you're going to go? I'm like super open to, to whatever, honestly, as long as it's, it's the right company, the right mission, the right opportunity, the right win-win. Yeah. Um, I love seeing stuff like that Helio Gray does where he'll, he'll literally get like a cycling team that'll have his design on the shirt. Um, you know, I've seen guys paint with Jack, I think is his name. He like painted like a, like a, with a, a monster energy, like Java, yeah mm -hmm. java chip new thing where he literally painted with brown and like there's a there's a cool little sponsored brand deal like i've like tagged gucci in some of my stuff because i just mm -hmm. love the iconic gucci stripe i don't necessarily relate to like the brand or whatever but like the yeah. colors themselves are really cool to play with and like i've tagged them and stuff so like something like that or mclaren like mclaren colors oh, in my yeah. last painting like I'd love that to be in their office or they can commission me like the speed of my work and then incorporate into a commercial or some kind of like user generated content. There's all these different avenues, man. And it's just got to be the right opportunity, but I'm doing, I'm doing it all myself. And like, if anyone's listening that has, you know, connections in those kind of spaces and wants to work with me to help find that, like hit me up seriously. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. 
Um, yeah, I think getting into like licensing is a great way to sort of sustain um, a thriving art career from what I've heard. Yeah, what's an example of, of licensing? Uh, well, for instance, uh, my friends, I guess this podcast won't come out for a few weeks, um, but my friends at uh, Verde, they're a, uh, they're a, a uh, cannabis store here in Colorado. Mm-hmm. Um, and their, their other store is Dab Logic, or their other brand is Dab Logic. They're putting my brain piece on uh, a new strain of flower that's coming out. In, that's a in perfect uh, collaborate yeah. oh yeah yeah so it's like a good fit it's you know simple easy um and di- different uh different licensing uh s- deals and structures uh or there are different licensing deals and structures out there i just charged them a one-time flat fee um, because it was kind of the first time i've licensed my art but I know that um, you can also ask for a percentage of That's sales right. for things. That's wild. That would be such a cool way to, to partner because there's so much yeah. upside potential. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like you're more invested in the the overall mission collectively. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, honestly, my knowledge in this area is, is very limited. Um, it'd be a cool thing to learn more about. Yeah. Because same I know that yeah. It's, it's essentially just like a great business move because work that you've already created is still sort of consistently earning you money. If, especially if you can get with like a big brand or, or just, um, a big company that, that makes a lot of sales and say you wanted to put your art on. See, and I mean, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little, personal like i'm interested in working with some disc golf brands because i was just at um the u.s dgc which u.s disc golf championship Mm -hmm. um with my friends uh logan and jared and they sort of got me in and they've been painting murals at these like major opens um and disc golf is i think the fastest growing sport in america right now and to uh pickleball (laughs) Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, and you know, I've been playing forever. I'm still not very good, but whatever. Um, but I met some of the brands out there and I think it would be, it would be just super sweet to, you know, make new designs for them every once in a while. And totally. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that would be sick. I mean, that's, I, I, I see it almost less as like a play on, revenue but more like a brand play is the way Mm -hmm. i see it and also like introducing uh your art to different um markets even Mm -hmm. like uh and that's that's why i went with an international investment art gallery like i could run something domestic but you know i've heard the domestic market is a little less strong than like the international london market so mm-hmm. I made that decision, right? And I'm just trying to spread as, as wide as possible. So like those type of brand deals, I think are in line with that mission. Totally, totally. Yeah, there's so many paths that, uh, that an artist can take to to just make it work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, so I think we'll round it out here. Um, dude, thank you for being a being on the podcast uh thank you for a blast me. yeah surreal this is that a great time chad and i'd love to come back another time if, if you do that yeah for sure definitely have return guests on um i'm going at a bit of a slower pace nowadays um but hopefully i will uh speed that up as time goes on cool um uh, and like I don't even, I can't imagine what you went through like two years ago, man. So there's the fact that you're like getting back into this and I think you're like doing a big service to the art community too, just by helping get, give us a platform to really speak an hour or two about things. Mm -hmm. People that like other artists can connect with that. And like, I don't know, I've listened to, I've listened to a few of your old pods. Like when I was just starting, like Vlad, Vladimir Kranich's like one of my favorite artists ever. And yeah, nice. God, dude, his, his technical 
way of looking at things is insane bro and for him to still have so much like chaos throughout it it's he's a beast and just you totally. giving that platform to be able to do that man so thank you so much i think you're doing a great thing thanks man i appreciate it and i yeah feels good to hear that dude we'll have to hit a festival or something let's do it let's do it um but yeah again thanks so much and uh We'll catch you next time on RTA. Thank you again for listening to another episode of RTAF Podcast. If you are interested in supporting the Patreon, that address is patreon.com slash RTAF Podcast. And I want to thank all my patrons. You guys keep this engine running. I couldn't do it without you. Go over there and check out the tiers I have available. Thank you again for listening. Please rate, review, subscribe. Do all those little things that help get RTAF into the consciousness of more and more people. Shout out.